Put your hands together one time and help me pray for one sinner from the ghetto. Oh Lord, we call him Harold Jones and he plays drums. Would you do it for him one time? Yeah, 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 yeah. They appreciate you, Harold Jones. And playing bass, Lord, you know that he's a sinner. <laughs> I saw you stash, oh Lord, 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 would you please <laughs> put a blessing on Brother Ed Boyer. We appreciate you too. <laughs> Hit that note again. Let me see if that's still right. <laughs> And oh Lord, from the ghetto, from a one hundred thousand dollar house that ghetto. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lord, you don't need to bless him no more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please get together for Mr. George Gaffney. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, comedy on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. We can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today, and what an honor it is. I, my show has become about rhythm because rhythm is love, and everybody has their own original heartbeat and their own sound and their own swagger and the way they walk. And My guest today came up at a time when everybody was trying to create their own individual sound. Uh, nobody wanted to sound like anybody else and because there were no drum machines, and and quite frankly, the technology wasn't what it was today. Uh, people were on the bandstand six nights a week, three sets a night, and uh, they were able to woodshed it out in front of live audiences. And my guest is in the same discussion as Papa Joe Jones, Philly Joe Jones, uh, Max Roach, uh, uh, Tiny Khan. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and uh, it's just... Uh, it's just stunning. He's still playing his butt off today with Tony Bennett. Uh, he's putting in time on planet Earth. Harold Jones, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, thank you very much, Jay. All right. All right, baby. Hey, you know, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, uh, did you recognize that tune coming in? Not coming in, but I, I, I mean, I recognize Marlena Shaw. Well, that and, and that was you playing with her live at Montro in 73. Yeah. You know, and, and I wanted to ask you, I interviewed Julian Priester uh, a, a couple times, and he talked about playing with Howlin' Wolf. And um, I wanted you to talk about the, the Blues Cats, because the Blues was right alongside the Jazz uh, when you were coming up. And I really wanted you to talk about uh, some of the ma the blues masters that you played with, and ultimately, um, how if if that in fact helped you uh, learn to play a shuffle. Well, uh, I don't know. Coming coming up with the blues in in Chicago on the South Side, that was something you just kind of heard coming out of every that you walked by, unless unless you heard some jazz with Gene Ammons or something like. 
like that, the big dinners. But it was a, it was a thing that you kind of like heard. And then uh, great people that played the blues, Fetter, the organist, uh, he was with John Lee Hooker some 20 years or so. So I've been around the blues hearing it uh, very all my life. I did a world tour with B.B. King and Ray Charles. And 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 B.B. won a Grammy. We did an album with him. So, but I had Ray Brown on bass. <laughs> oh, that, that <laughs> that's not too bad. No, I mean, can you talk about, wh- like, if those guys, I have a big problem. I interviewed Alan Toussaint uh, before he passed. And he talked about the fact that everybody has a tuner now. You can tune your instrument to make it perfect. The problem is, if you put it, if you if you carry that tuning all the way through your life, then that is what it becomes. And to me, uh, you guys didn't have tuners, um, and a lot of those blues cats they did not get uptight whether the tempo slowed up or sped up or slowed down. I mean, did you have a chance to play um, with Sun Ra or any of the free jazzers? Uh, I mean, because go ahead. I, was, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you said Sun Ra. I was playing drums with Sun Ra in his band in Chicago, playing sorority and fraternity dancers. Dances. Oh, oh I love this. I need to he- talk about that. Please break this down. How did that? How did that happen? We all went to these gigs and played these uh, parties for the sororities and fraternities. Southside Chicago, and we were wearing blue suits, white shirts, and a long tie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, go, go ahead. I was with Don Rob before he got his interstellactic orchestra. Orchestra. <laughs> orchestra, yeah. No, dude, Harold, tell me, though, tell me about um, were you playing bebop, or what were you playing? Uh, no, I want to say it would probably. You know, that's a really a good question. It, it wasn't bebop, and it wasn't rock and roll at that time. And uh, I think it was just like standard songs that uh, maybe Lena Horne or Dinah Washington were singing, or Billie Holiday. Uh, I I don't I don't know if you call that the Great American Songbook. <laughs> no, that's right. That's the great. That's Rodgers and Hammerstein. Or, but I mean, like, did you have a did like did you have were you were you backing a singer or were you playing instrumental? No, we just played instrumental. This is shocking stuff. I mean, because here's here's the question I wanted. I want you to break this down for the audience listening worldwide because it's really important. Um, you know, when I interviewed Julian, do you know Julian by the way? So, Julian talked about, in Sun Ra's band, and this is a couple years later, obviously, when he was starting to get a little more experimental, and he, he, he put the onus, the, each player in the band had to have their own internal time feel, and if, if you didn't, then you were going to struggle with that. It, ultimately, what was happening was, by everybody having their own internal time feel on the bandstand, it opened up the rhythm section. Cats like Harold Jones, Ray Brown, whoever. It allowed that. It, it allowed you to play melodically. It allowed you to just uh, not just have to keep time, but play melodically. And can you can you talk? Maybe it wasn't with Sun Ra, but when was the first chance that you had to, where you were able to, because everybody in the band had great time feel, that you were able to really play melodic ideas on the kit well i i got my thoughts of melodic playing from drummers other drummers like max roach you know uh, louis belson but I, and it wasn't necessarily melodic but it was very musical <laughs> it, it was it wasn't like they were playing a drum exercise it, it, to me it, it it sounded like they were painting a picture can you talk about this, like, when you, uh, 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 an experience when you saw, what was it, was it, like, when you, when, when they were just paint, that's what I meant to say, was they were painting on the kit. I mean, can you talk about it in a time when you, and then how did you integrate that in, into your own playing? Well, uh, I, I, I would integrate it like, uh, you can only go as much as your own technique and let you do it, but to try to, uh, 
uh, come up with some musical ideas similar to what I heard Max doing or Louis Belson doing within the form of the song. I was I was never a soloist like uh, the Buddy Rich that that you could solo without any form at all. And then when you wanted to bring the band in, play the triplets, because Buddy was a great soloist. And you know you had those guys like Sonny Payne that were soloists. And uh, I I was more the kind of guy that would be in there in the section, in the rhythm section. Yeah. No, I dig. I did. No, but I mean. I guess what I'm trying to say is like, um, when did you like one once, once you got off the the sorority fraternity circuit with Sun Ra, um, yeah. who who what was the first what was the first kind of serious gig that you were on? Did you play on the Chitlin circuit? Well, I got to play in the house band, like at McKee's Show Lounge or. Uh, there, there were different places. Dinah Washington owned a club on the south side, and I was in the house band there. There was a C&C show lounge, uh, and I was in the house band there. There was a Pershing where uh, Ahmed Jamal got his claim. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, then I did some things like uh, McKee's. But uh, in, anyway, there were several clubs. I was be, be playing around there in the house band. And uh, uh, I, don't know, I forgot how I was going to say this. <laughs> no, you know what I wanted to ask you about was, uh, so it, it, essentially what was so amazing about, well, first of all, don't be modest. I know you're not like a, a, a you know, you're not somebody who likes to show off monster chops, but I mean, there's, there, there's that legendary story of your mom driving you to, to, to Indianapolis, or uh, I don't know, you went, you went to go see Wes, and Wes left the stage, you did a 20-minute drum solo? <laughs> so I mean, you you could solo, man. I mean, maybe you just didn't put it in the repertoire all the time. It wasn't that fitting, but I mean, Harold Jones, yeah. you can solo a little bit. Okay, man. Okay, all right. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. This is the other part of it is that we have. I'm sure that when you play with Tony today, we have the best sound technology in the world today, and you can lock it in so that you can hear everybody on the bandstand. That was not the case when you were playing Dinah Washington's room or McKee's. I mean, sometimes you were playing out of a PA system. Uh, right. and, and, and this is the thing I want you to talk about. When did your ears grow the most on the bandstand? Because, because not everything was amplified. Sometimes the bass wasn't even amplified. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh. I don't know, man. Just in, in, in playing in the different bands and places and different kind of rooms, yeah, you be, you learned how to play with volume according to the what you were hearing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Well, I mean, explain what you mean by that. You you learned how to play with volume. Well, when I would be with uh, Dinah Washington's club, there was Sleepy Anderson was playing organ. Oh boy, and Leo Pevens on guitar. And man, they just turned them up. And <laughs> yeah, it was. I can't remember it never swinging. It was just always swinging. And uh, that that was the kind of uh, clubs I was working around there. And then I got lucky with a couple of. I joined bands like we had Eddie Harris. Oh my God, uh, Exodus to Jazz is is one of the seminal albums. Yeah, see, that was the number one jazz record to sell a million records. No matter what anybody tries to say today, that was the first one. You're absolutely 100% right, dude. Joe DiOrio, that that album is ridiculous. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And then off there, you know, I bounced off and went out with that Paul Winter group. We did some, some 23 countries for Kennedy. And then we got to be the first jazz band to play in the White House which a lot of people called in and complained because they said, hey, if you're going to have the first jazz band in the White House, it should be Duke, Count, you know, or, or Dizzy or Satchmo. Well, I don't know about Satchmo, but anyhow, <laughs> they were saying uh, uh, all of those kind of things, and technically they were right. But uh, the occasion was, and, and the Paul Winter Group, we had just won a national contest for jazz bands. So it was a natural pick, and Paul Winter was able to get us in on that. And uh, that's how we got into 
that kind of a claim to fame. Because, because the, the occasion at the White House was going to be for the sons and daughters of dignitaries visiting Washington during that week. And they asked the kids and daughters what they'd like to hear. And, of course, that's best. wanted to hear American jazz. So and we had just won the, uh, uh, the award for the best college jazz band. And uh, uh, well, they picked us to play there for the kids. Yeah, it was a natural fit. Talking to Harold Jones here on the, on the Jake Feinberg show. You know, did you, did you know the Congo player, Big Black? I didn't know him personally well, but, yeah, I knew him. Yeah, okay, I so I, this is I want to I want to get the Harold Jones. Uh, I want you to riff on this, just your own opinion. You know, you go back in time, and the word, according to Black, the word was jazz, J A S S, because essentially you were going to the brothels in New Orleans, and you'd have a ragtime or stride piano player downstairs, but essentially you were going to get some action, and it was considered jazz, J A S S, and then according to Black. When cats like Lee Morgan and Dizzy and the Bebop came in and they and then white commercial record owners uh, realized that they could monetize this music, they said, we can't have jazz. We have to drop the S's and they put the Z's on. So it became jazz. And so I'm curious about, I think, terminology. And then now you fast forward to today and you ask people what jazz is and you get 15 different answers. And I'm just trying to figure out from Harold Jones's point of view. I mean, if when you were with Basie, I mean, or even before that, I mean, did you guys use terminology to describe the music, or was it really the Duke Ellington School at that time? It was just play music. Yes. Yep. I didn't know what to say until you said that, but they, it was just play music, and I think it was like Duke Ellington himself that said, "There's no such thing as the kind of music that's just good and bad." That and that's that would leave, yeah, and that and that's a subjective thing. It's all music, and then it, the subjective part is either it's good or bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Who yeah. was the Who was the rhythm section that you were talking about? The organ player and the guitar player in Chicago. Sleepy Anderson. He was the organ player in Dinah Washington's band, and and we played the house the house band uh, in Chicago South Side. And, and uh, Leo Blevins was on guitar. Leo Blevins, dude. That dude was... Was Richard Evans around at that time? Yes, he was in Chicago. Can well, you, t- you know, he went out with us with Paul Winter. That's right. He did on that... In that 62 White House run. Yes. I yeah. mean, th- th- this is what I wanted you to talk about is because you go to a... Ro- Again, I hate labels, but you go to a rock show today. You go to any kind of music today. The drums and the sound are at the forefront. It's become a louder instrument. And you can look to Mahavishnu and Billy Cobham and Weather Report and Return to Forever. Lenny White, those guys were such artists. But the the music, the fusion music, got louder and louder and louder. Uh, To the best you can, can you talk about what your role was as an accompanist? The drum was really an accompanist instrument. You said they turned up the organ and the guitar, and it would cook. But it wasn't up to you to necessarily be the... the I I had to do mine physically and acoustically, and I had to turn up the drums. That's what I meant by that, because they were both amplified. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, at this point, um, uh, can you talk a little bit about the cut sessions? I mean, did, did you wind up with uh, Johnny Griffin? Up, Chicago was a bastion for this stuff. I, I, you know, I just want you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the oh, oper- yeah. Johnny Griffin and Sonny Stitt on the stage at the same time. They play one tune that would be fifteen to twenty minutes long, <laughs> and then they would tag it for thirty minutes. <laughs> In Chicago, you could be on the stage for almost an hour doing one tune with those kind of jazz club. They were airing it on the radio. Okay, I'm sitting here playing the drums on this tune. A tenor player comes up to me on the side of the stage and says, Hey, I was at home. I heard you guys on the radio, and I thought I'd come down here and get a piece of it. (laughs) (laughs) I had to make a rule, man. You got to be in the room when the song starts. 
<laughs> yeah, but that's still so cool. It was local, regional radio. They could hear you burning, and they're coming downstairs yeah. to the club. I mean, that to me is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Did, when was yeah, the we first? Did you? Did you? Uh, you know, it's funny. I had a chance to do a a roundtable discussion with uh, on Facebook Live with Ron Carter, Kenny Barron, and Billy Cobham, and Ron Ron revealed to me that he was on the Chitlin circuit with a gospel group uh, doing the whole Rochester, uh, the whole New York circuit. And I, and I was thinking to myself last night, I was so geeked up for this interview. I said, I, you know, Harold, I have to, I, I just want to believe that you did go and play um, on the Chitlin circuit with, you know, gospel. Did you, did you have that experience on the road before you got with bass? I did. I didn't have to leave Chicago to go on a chitlin circuit. You know? <laughs> I played with Roosevelt Sykes, the original Honey Dripper. Oh my! Please talk about this band, please. And I can't remember where I sat in at some place we were jamming, and uh, Roosevelt Sykes came up to me. And he says, "Hey, man, because I had a, just bought this Chevy station wagon, you know, like ten years old or something." Sure. And and I went to. Uh, uh, this jam session. He came up and when he heard me playing, and he said, "Hey, man, um, you sound good. Is that your car there?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, you sound good. We can use you." <laughs> and sure enough, man, I got on his gigs and his bands. But we were living in Chicago and working in Calumet City. They they had a strip. They they were strip joint after strip joint in Calumet City, Indiana. And, and uh, man, I'd leave to pick up the guys in the band at 6 o'clock in the evening, and it was daylight. We'd go out, and we'd play over to Calumet City, and we'd play till 4 in the morning, and we'd come home, and by the time I dropped everybody off, it was daylight. On, oh, man. Wait, hold on. I want to be clear. You met, you met Rose, Roosevelt in Chicago, and then you were winding up in the stri strip clubs in Indiana? Yeah. Yeah, well, we lived in Indiana and drove there every night. Yeah. Okay. So the Honey Drippers, you would, uh, what kind of, was it R&B music? I mean, you also, or what, what, like you, you were actually playing for shake dancers. Uh, it was R&B music. And the dancers were dancing to his song. Can you talk about how that helped you develop your own individual style? I've talked to so many guys who played the burlesque houses, including Ahmad Jamal, who used to play eight hours at a time, just piano and drums. And when the drummer got tired, he'd play piano and Ahmad would play drums. But ultimately, they had to hit the moves of the dancers. And the dancers... Well, I want to say, even today, I play with my eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> within the swing and then catch and they weren't always good dancers you know but when they did the kick you'd have to catch the kick yeah huh. and it wouldn't necessarily always be in that good time so it did help you give you some and like they said in playing that many hours and that long if it doesn't really do you in and kill you it'll really build you up so, uh, well, that's what I was going to say is that w when you talked about Johnny Griffin and Sonny Stitt, just, just, I mean, bars after bars after. I remember a cat that wound up playing with uh, with uh, Sonny Stitt and Billy James. Did you know Billy James and uh, Don Patterson and those cats? No. So, I mean, they, they basically were Sonny's rhythm section in the 60s, and, and they just said, listen, you're going to – they were telling this guy Bobby Pierce, you're going to see as we go on tour over time – with the groups that we're sharing bills with, we're just going to be physically stronger than them. We're going to wear, we, we, we're just going to be, our stamina is going to be built up because of this relentless blowing. And I, yeah. I, I, I mean, did you, did you get, how did you not, um, well, I guess the, the question is what was your, for 45 minutes, I mean, how free would, I mean, how much, how much um, how much freedom did you have on the kit, or were you just really playing the same groove for an hour? Well, yeah, that depends. We didn't play necessarily the same groove for an hour, 
but you, you would try to lock it in and get some kind of lock-in sound going. And then occasionally they'd always bring it to what it sounded like a, a climax of a climax. And you'd build it up and play some bigger fills and bigger crashes. And then go right back into the lock in. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I just thought that was good. Wait till you hear this. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, uh, um, Harold, can you, like, would you say that, uh, I mean, did you get a chance to play with with Bird? Or did you ever get a chance to, st- no. to hang with, with Bird? No. First time I ever even heard about Charlie Parker was 56, he died, and I was in high school. I was coming home in the car with some uh, other hip jazz cats, like Joe Hunt. He was a drum from Richmond, Indiana. And, uh, I mean, these kind of cats, man, they wore the sunglasses at night, you know. Oh, um, my love. I need, wait, you were wearing sunglasses at night, dude. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I saw these guys, uh, they teared up that afternoon. We were coming home from school, going someplace, and I said to them, I said, what happened? And they said, Charlie Parker died today. And, and the first time I heard a bird, and I knew he had to be something, because these were the heaviest jazz cats I knew, and they were tearing up. I want to yeah. ask you something. Joe Hunt, so you were playing with these guys in high school, though, is that right? Yes. Can you talk about who was in that band and ultimately – the kind of music you were, I'm still trying to get to this nexus between, uh, you know, it was not, clearly not swing, and it was, was it bebop, I mean, what were you playing, because you said these were the most serious jazz cats in the world, and the 50s. Joe Hunt, Joe Hunt was in the bebop, he was ahead of his time, to me. Yeah, I know that name, who else was in that band? Uh, well, John Pierce was a saxophone player that was leading us all around. He was the only man that was within his 20s to 30s. And then Joe was a two, three years older than me. So uh, uh, everybody was around that age. And they were all high teenagers, low 20s. Uh, but Andy Simpkins was a bass player. Oh, my. Are you kidding me? This is How old was Andy at that time? Well, Andy was right. He was, he's older than, he was older than Joe. But uh, we were all in our 20s. Yeah. The oldest guy would have been 30-something. I just, I'd like you to talk a little bit about John Pierce. Uh, I, Lee Charlton, who connected us, uh, burned me a CD of a, a jam session in Reno, Nevada with Ellis Marsalis and uh, Bill Hayden, who was Charlie Hayden's brother, and Lee on drum. Lee just put on the, hit the record button. And it took me a couple years, and I started. I, I've been on the road quite a bit as a journalist, and I, I was listening, to, to this out to this recording session. I've never now again. I'm not a huge Bird aficionado, and I didn't hear Bird yeah. live, but I'm not even comparing him to Bird. I, this was yeah. like 1968, so Train had died the year before. Martin Luther King had been assassinated. I mean, this guy was playing as if his... I've never heard anybody play with that kind of visceral energy. And I want you to yeah. break it... I want you to break down John Pierce for the audience because he is an unsung cat. Well, I don't know that I can say it any better than you just did. Oh, come on, you were there. I'm 40 years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, he was. He was that strong. And he was the kindest, most gentle guy. He was leading us kids into into music history. I mean, really. He was up with he was up with him, and then when Ornette Coleman came on along, they they acknowledged Ornette. They uh, John even bought a plastic saxophone. <laughs> I freaking love it, dude. Are you kidding me? Uh, yeah, yeah. But then I think he realized, nah, he was going back to the metal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, this 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 session is is the most I, I've never heard him. It, it's like it's. Can you explain how he he helped take you to to another level musically? Well, when you're playing along as a drummer in a rhythm section with him, the ideas were never the same. So you had to cont- constantly and be uh, and stick something in and where you better stay out of. Yeah, because you don't want to step on him when he's running, running some line. Yeah. Uh, it was just so. Um, 
You know, I, I often ask the, uh, I wanted you to talk about this. Um, you know, I often ask a lot of the drummers this idea, this concept that, um, you know, you're playing. Stitt and, and Griffin may not be the greatest example because that was um, pretty straight ahead. But, you know, you're in the middle of a, of a jam and um, and then Every, you know, you lose where the one, da- where the downbeat is. You know, you lose where the one is. And, you know, you're in this sort of experimental music, and then everybody comes back in on the one. And it's one of the most yeah. magical things in the world. And so I wanted to get Harold Jones's philosophy, because I see a lot of younger cats very insecure. They're, they're yelling, where's the one? Where's the one? Where's the one? And, you know, James Jamerson used to say, any note can be the one. And that's what I want to ask you, Harold Jones. Any note can be the one. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, like playing in a band like Basie's band, or when that rhythm section set up, and it was a four-man rhythm section. And when that rhythm section was marching along, it just seemed like you couldn't hit anything wrong. <laughs> Whatever you hit sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's something about... Playing, when you're playing with a band that is organized, but you still have the freedom, oh, man, that's having your cake and eating it, too. Well, I'll, but explain that. I, I, and, and, and it was a four-man rhythm section, so it, it was Fr- Freddie Green. Who was yeah. who was on on bass? When I was there, most of the time, it was Norman Keenan. Ah, I don't know that name. I know he was very unknown. He played with Harry Belafonte years <laughs> before Basie. Yeah. And he, he was a four-on-the-floor man. He was no more than what Basie wanted. You know what I mean? Well, I want you to talk about having your cake and eating it, too. I mean, this cause, because to my ear, Basie's music is not – it's it's not psychedelic. It's not – you know, it's, it's, it's just burning, burning music. And you're telling me that essentially, though, that, that philosophy of any note could be the one – could apply to, to that band. Right, right, yeah. We have a, you, we, you know, yeah. But I mean, but but when you play with some bands back there that are dance bands, it's like you see these rock festivals today. I mean, back there with Basie, there was a big ballroom, and and everybody's heads was going up and down at the same time, like you see at a rock festival when they start swaying their arms. Oh my God! And, yeah, the only other times I've ever seen that was like. West Montgomery, in a club. Yeah. You now and but West wasn't playing. He was playing with like a quartet. It wasn't a big band. No quartet. Oh my god! And people were people were 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 just dancing in the wind on this. I mean, that to me is the most magical thing. Can you talk about that collective consciousness when, when the band is locked in at that level, and then it gets and then it goes to the audience, and then it comes back. I'm sure you still have it happen with. With Tony once in a while, but that's the, there's only two letters that separate magic and music. You know, I mean, to me, it's the most magical thing in the world, because that's what that's what the language of music is supposed to do. It's supposed to enlighten people. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna and put. That, yeah, go ahead. I think that's why I've like wanted to stay within the uh, American Songbook, because I know I like for the people that are listening. To feel like they have some knowledge of the music that they're hearing. I don't want to get too esoteric on them. On the other hand, you do like to keep it fresh, which would mean something kind of new. And how do you go about doing that without, you know, tripping out to the point where the artist himself is the only one who understands what was just done? So. Well, you make uh, a good. Can you talk a little? Can you talk about uh, the? I mean, outside of. Obviously, you were on the road with Basie a lot, but was there an experimental group that you, even a percussive group? I mean, Max Roach had had M Boom. There were these all these jet. Did you were you part of any of these? What was the most experimental band that you played in? And I know what you're saying because a lot of people will say that jazz. Again, I hate that word, but that that jazz yeah. became an inside joke for jazz musicians because the audience couldn't figure out what the tune was. They'd leave the head of the tune. It was way too free, but what was the most experimental uh, group that, that, that you played in? Uh, well, there was, there was a 
couple of them. And I mean, way back then, Eddie Harris was considered experimental because he was putting a saxophone reed on a trumpet, and he was putting a trombone mouthpiece on a saxophone. Holy sh! Oh my God, that's yeah. insane. That's he pretty experimental. One, and he and he invented that thing where he'd play the sax, but he put it through a, a mach- the 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 a key the soundboard, and it came out like five different saxes. So he, so he could, it sounded like a sax section when he was playing. Yeah. Eddie Harris was one of the first ones. So that he was trying to experiment a lot like that. Now, then, go ahead. There was a piano player, Andrew Hill. Oh, I know. Are, you played with Andrew? Oh, yeah. Oh, please yeah. talk about, dude, he gets, tell me about, because that dude was right there, I mean, as progressive as, as Thelonious or any of those cats. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. And we were doing commercial gigs, too. We were backing up Lorez Alexandria. And uh, we were doing gigs like that where there were singers, you know what I mean? Yeah. Did you yeah. – I'm curious about the um, – in Chicago, uh, did, did – the? I'll just throw out a name, Louis Satterfield. Did you ever play with Louis? No, but – Satterfields, this is, I know the Satterfields. I I'm know just the name. Yeah, well, I mean that they were essentially the Chicago Wrecking Crew. It was Morris Jennings, Bobby Christian, oh, yeah. yeah, and you know Phil Upchurch and those cats. I'm just trying to figure out when you left yeah, Chicago. Yeah, I know them all. You I know, know all of those guys personally. By the way, by the way, is Mo- Morris is gone, right? Uh, uh, Morris left us, yes, yes. Uh, Mo- Morris Jennings, I always get him confused with Maurice White. But, yeah, Morris Jennings is gone. And then Bo- yeah. Bobby Christian. Say again? What about Jimmy Ellis? God, who's Jimmy? I don't know who Jimmy Ellis is. Oh, I thought you said Jimmy's name with you. We're talking about Morris Ellis uh, or Morris Jennings. Morris Jennings, uh, Maurice White. It was another drummer, uh, and then Richard Kurt Evans obviously Meyer. has passed away. Um, I know, I know them. I knew him. Were you in the, your 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 discography is so insane because it basically it's so under it's not up to date on the all music guide at all, and um, I tend to think that you were probably just touring relentlessly. But did you did you record in Chicago at all? Man, I was up down there on Rush Street every day. I was doing TV commercials, like the Jolly Green Giant. Oh, I love the, this. Uh, the, the, you were doing jingles and commercials and yeah. Sud commercials. That was it, jingle. Yeah. That was the other cat I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, is the the Senator Eugene Wright? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to tell me about that cat. Did you did you have a chance to? To, was, did you did you play with him and Basie? No, no, not with Basie. But I did private little gigs around Chicago, around there. Yeah. When did you? How did you connect with Count? Well, uh, a trombone player on this band named Harlan Floyd uh, called me because uh, Rufus Reed, Rufus. Before me, he uh, had got on Duke's band, and they went to the Far East, and they weren't going to be back in time for uh, to play at the Empire State Building at the Rainbow Room on New Year's Eve. Basie always played there every year like that with uh, two, three, four singers, and uh, they needed a drummer that could read, and the, the, all the drummers that could read in New York were working <laughs> on New Year's. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so they flew me there from Chicago, and I sat down and uh, read the shows, and we went on the air within two days. Yeah. How did you? Oh, did, you're so modest. How? I mean, where did you get your reading chops? How did you? I mean, just from the studio. I mean, you were doing jingles. That wasn't necessarily. And most of the cats that were arranging music back then, they just give you some chord chord changes. They would it wouldn't be overly arranged. How did you learn to read? I learned to read because in Indiana, they ran a music program, 13 weeks, five days a week. Am 
government. I don't care what it is. And uh, for 13 weeks I went there. And because I signed up, I signed up. I wanted to play trumpet because I thought Miles was it. Mm -hmm. and, and did. And I tell you, man, in Indiana, I didn't know exactly how to spell trumpet. <laughs> I, knew, I knew it started with the letter T. So when I signed up in the music room, they said, check off what instrument you want to play. I checked off the smallest word that started with T. But <laughs> something was small, you know. And so the next day, when this guy came into the band room with all of our instruments, he put that tuba around me, man. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I stuttered. And I said, but I, I, I really wanted to play the drum. <laughs> yeah, you're like I just I just chose the. Well, you did want to. You loved, you loved no, my. No, you know what? He was a great music teacher in Indiana, and this is back when they didn't have prejudice type things musically. I mean, this guy told me, I I'm glad you picked the tuba, because uh, I forget how he said it, but your your people have larger lips, and they fit the mouthpiece better. I, I never forget that as a beginning kid. Holy! And so, what kind of he was? He, you really learned to read extensive, like pretty, pretty intense, like no. big, like what kind of charts were you were you were you reading? They they no no they sit they took me across the hall to the drum room. <laughs> now all the kids in there had a drum, and I they exist. I didn't say drum. I had to use a practice pad. I love this. So about yeah, so for about the first two weeks, I was on a pad reading out of a book before I ever got to a drum. So, you, yeah, and in Indiana, I mean, you you take your homework home and you do stuff like that. You know, it was way before cell phones or almost before TV, almost. But uh, anyway, that's how I learned how to read. And then I had a great teacher uh, that, that was a... Uh, a uh, vaudeville drummer named Jack Krakowski. Wow. And he had a xylophone band. And I mean, this guy taught me to read what they, I mean, we had the cowbell and wood block on the bass drum, which was uh, like 30 inches high. <laughs> and had the picture of the lake on the front of it and the light inside to keep the heads dry and to light up the lake. And uh, wood blocks and chimes. And, and uh, stick beats on the bass drum. I mean, I've only seen older drummers, Buddy and, and Joe and them, know what that even was. But anyway, uh, so I was reading and enjoying it and hearing and making the music before. I, it was never soloing and just a whole lot of perpetual sound. So, yeah, I was enjoying it and learning as a youngster. What was the instrumentation in the xylophone band? That sounds ex highly experimental for the 50s. You're right. You're right. And uh, I'm going to say it was vaudeville. And you know what? I'd have to, honestly, I can't remember, but I want to say it was like four or five of them in the band, like two or three girls and or two or three guys. Wow. Yeah. Because later on, I went out with a percussion group like that called the per Dutton Percussion Trio. Can you spell, we, we, wait, I'm sorry, spell, spell that again? The Dutton, D-U-T-T-O-N. And it was a, tr okay, break, I need you to break this down immediately. Who was in that trio and what, what, what was that about? That is insane. Well, well, we had, uh, everybody played mallets uh, and some kind of percussion, and I had the drum set. And uh, we actually went on tour with Roger Williams. No way. Yeah, and it was really a great tour because <laughs> he always packed and sold out in advance. The original elevator music. The, but, uh, wait, wait, wait. I mean, wait, what are you talking about? In advance, and we went around backing him up with a translated whatever his orchestra parts was like on the record. They uh, put that in, uh, translated it into a percussion. So we had like Two, two players that could play four mallets. I could only play two mallets. And and, on, and I, they usually put me on a bass part if I wasn't on the drum set. Yeah. 
Wait, I want to. Wait, I want to be clear. You were playing. If if you weren't on the kit, you were playing bass. So I've enjoyed it. Being in percussion opened up my ears for uh, playing the drum set. Well, I want to throw in a piece of music for you right now. I don't know when the last time you heard it, uh, but I want you to take a listen to it, and we'll come back and talk about it, okay? Okie doke. What do you got for us, Mr. Jones? <laughs> I ain't heard that since we did it. Uh, I do Gypsy Queen, which apparently was written by Gabor Zabo, uh, arranged by Oliver Nelson, produced by Bob Thiel. I don't know if you have this album, but there are just, it's the most cooking, it's Afrique. Uh, count. Oh, yeah. Okay? I mean, yeah. I mean, to me, First of all, and by the way, your your boy uh, Norman Keenan's on bass and John B. Williams on electric bass. But can you talk a little bit about um, when you moved to New York, uh, the brotherhood that existed uh, as it related to uh, the musical community there? Did you go to Jim and Andy's a lot? Did you play a lot of sessions there? And just talk about that vibe. Oh, the Brotherhood in New York was uh, total for real and natural, and that was how you did it. You'd go to uh, 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 Frank 
Dick Eppolito had a drum shop you go to every day. Joe Jones, Elvin Jones. There'd be so many different drummers. Joe Morello that would come around to those places and hang. And you could just hang and talk. Before, during, or after a gig. And the uh, first time I met Jim and Andy, I went in there with... Uh, uh, oh, God, can't think of his name. Jake Hanna. Oh, I and love it, dude. Jake. I love and, it. And uh, I, I don't know how I got a paycheck. It must have been from the union from a recording or something. And I, I didn't have a bank account or anything in New York. And uh, Jake said, oh, here, you can cash it right here. Exactly. They could cash your checks right at the bar. Yeah. And you know that Jim, he, he, he looks at the check and he looks at me. Then he looked over at Jake and he said, do you know him? And Jake said, yeah. And Jim said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these... It, that, was, that was all there was to it, man. And that was, that was Jim and Andy's. And by the way, Andy was a cat. He could play, you mean? No. And no. <laughs> <laughs> Andy was a four-legged cat. <laughs> Re oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, dude. Oh, yeah. I, so, I mean... Well, yeah, go ahead. A lot of people didn't know that. Yeah, they thought it was two guys. When you, like, uh, I want to just ask you about, you know, guys like um, Omar Clay and Joe Chambers, Sonny Morgan, the guys that played on, what's so cool about this album, that freak, and I recommend this, 1970, uh, just a blistering album, Sonny Morgan and Richard Pablo Landrum. I mean, how much did you connect with the, I mean, to me, Everything that relates to melodic improvisation, some people call that jazz, goes back to the African rhythms. The European harmonies had something to do with it. It's all about the African rhythms and diaspora. Um, how much did you get off on that? And how connected were you to the, to, to the rhythms, the timeless rhythms of your people? I don't know how to say how much I was connected to it because uh, as in the household in Indiana growing up, what we heard on the radio was what our parents listened to. And that was like Lena Horne, Tiny Bradshaw, Louis Armstrong. But uh, uh, I, I don't know how to answer that. Did you ever be, I mean, when you got to hang with, well, I, I mean, just the idea that did you? Go, when was the first time? Have you been to the motherland before? Yes. Can you talk about when you did you? Because I, I mean, you know, Benny Carter used. To, who'd you go over there with, and what was the experience like for you? What was profound about it? Well, the first time I went over there was with Sarah Vaughn back in the eighties. Wow. And we went on. We went over on Air Force. It wasn't Air Force One, <laughs> but it was like I don't know. They got two, three, four of those. Yeah, right. Air Force. <laughs> Uh, we went over on one that only had a couple of windows in the side at all uh, in, in the airplane. And uh, um, we went over there to Brazzaville, Sarah Vaughan, because they were, uh, it was the first time the Congo was going to become democratic. And uh, there was half, a few countries were for it, some countries were against it. Needless to say, there was an actual tank parked in front of the, the, the house that we played in. And that, that was the, uh, what do you call the guys that go there representing the United States? Or the diplomats or the ambassadors, yeah. The ambassador. In front of the ambassador's house, there was actually a real tank parked there. And uh, Jeez. that was on my first trip. And I mean... I actually, I don't know. I got something from that house. It, uh, I had to bring it home, and I got some pictures from. They took us down to the Congo, and that's when we found out the Congo River is fantastic. The little guys on their boats, they go f to go downstream. They go get on out there in the in the water, and they just let the current take them right on downstream. Now, when they're coming home at night, they come along the shore. The backwash is so strong. They come along the shore close, and uh, uh, that's 
how they get back up the stream, and they don't really have to paddle. And it gets so dark there at night that they whistle so to let the, uh, another boat know that they're coming. And a uh, man, there's some of the greatest whistlers you ever heard in your life. We were sitting out in a restaurant along that river, and uh, it was like dreamland. <laughs> but, yeah. I love this. Wait, did, did did you um how much I don't I don't want to say that this is uh something you might miss but the idea like when I I done a few interviews with Tootie Heath you know the drummer and he you know he talked about Freddie Green the, the thing about it was in Basie's band he basically was strumming and it was went along with the bass and the drums the color line right it was the color line right there it was supportive it was supportive as opposed to a solo instrument. And I, I think I think about music, when you first came up, talk about Sun Ra or Johnny Griffin or Sonny Stitt, the saxophone was the lead instrument. And the guitar was a rhythm instrument. And yep. it's really lacking today. A lot of cats yep. grow up learning to improvise on the guitar before they really learn rhythm. And if you don't have good rhythm, it's going to be a mess. I mean, do you yep. can you talk about how that... When you really noticed, I mean, did Basie's band ever change, or was it always the strumming guitar? It was always the strumming guitar, and that's what I I I grew up playing in trios like Max Roach type thing, or listening to the Miles with Philly Joe, you know, and then uh, uh, and Kenny Clark, and it was always a, a trio, but then they. Um, uh, when I got with Basie, I mean, the way Freddie Green and my hi-hat, because he sat on the end of the trombone row, which was the next thing over from the drums. He sat right beside me there. And his his guitar, his strumming, and my hi-hat, you couldn't hear either one. It was just a beautiful sound. <laughs> oh, I love <laughs> This is what I'm talking about. And that's what's missing in modern music today. Yeah. Yeah. When I, and when I hear, when I hear any of these cool bands, Usually the weakest section in a high school band is the rhythm section, which is a chain. Well, now, okay, I want to be clear about this. Can you, yeah. can you go a little bit deeper on that? Is it that it's, they're, they're driven by chops and facility and not about, gr about feel? What, what do you mean that it's the weakest one? Well, uh, okay, I'll say half and half. It's dri they're driven by chops, and they, they study that more of that, that way than play within the section to get their section to sound cohesive together, or usually the music teachers know how to play every instrument in the band but the drum. Mm. And the music teachers, they all appreciate it when I come around because I talk drum to the, to the students. And uh, these music teachers are good. I'm not putting negative on anything. How can you play trumpet and saxophone and <laughs> show all these kids the different instruments? But the drum, for some reason, is the one they know the least how to explain. I also or question whether it's, I mean, whether you want to be mediocre at all, at many instruments, or really hone in on one. I mean, that to me is also like... Right. You know, I mean, like, right. th but I mean, okay, I just want to be clear. Th how, it just, I'm a non-musician, but it, it, uh, clearly they're not incorporating rhythm guitars in the rhythm sections at these, at these schools now. And I'm curious about why... That strumming, that banjo strumming, uh, that guitar, that Freddie Green rhythm guitar, why it, 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 it made the band swing that much harder? Uh, it's hard for me to, hard for me to explain uh, because uh, it just locked in. It was a foundation. It was a cement basement. Right. Or whatever that band was playing over the top of it. And now I can't stand to hear a big band that doesn't have a four-piece rhythm section. <laughs> how many, can you tell me, because you see more than I do, how many do? Do do a lot of, do a, most of them or no? No, most of them don't. Well, that's it. And you know what, Duke didn't have a four-man. He only had three. Who was, yeah. but, he, but, he, but he, did he have a rhythm guitar player? No. Interesting, no. interesting. Well, Basie, Basie, I don't know. I mean, you know, listen, Harold, we've been cooking for an hour. Could we do part two next week? Are you going to be around? That'll be just fine, man. Yep.
Did you have a good yeah. time? Did you have a good time? Yeah, man. It didn't seem like an hour. <laughs> we're just listen. We're just getting started, man. We, we we I mean, this is just the beginning, and it is the. I just want to give a big shout out to Lee Charlton, and I want him to get on the men real quick and uh, and get yeah, help and get healthy again. And I know you guys are dear friends. And uh, okie dokie. All right, Bye. man. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Legendary drummer Harold Jones, and we'll be back right after this with Ian O'Connor on The Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you.